So, very welcome then, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to this workshop about, under the title, Uncovering the LGBTQ Movement. I don't really like the acronym. It's long, it doesn't sound good in, in the mouth when you say it, but that's the, the one they use, as, and that's also a one that's completed with more and more letters, as you heard. So, what I'm going to do today is this is not a lecture about sexual ethics. Uh, this is not a lecture basically about how we treat uh, and counsel people within this group. Uh, we'll, we'll deal, maybe come into it slightly, but it's basically going to be about the movement and I'm going to introduce by talking about the philosophy, the morals behind it, and I'm then go going to go over to the practical example that we studied in Sweden, uh, what practical uh, experience this ideology and philosophy has had in the public sphere. Uh, and finally, I try to share some good advice that have helped us in Sweden and that I think may be helpful to us how we treat and discuss these issues, both as individuals and as churches and as regular people on the public arena in the different nations that we live. So if I were to begin then with the, the root system and the ideology, uh, which I would say that secular individualism is the root system, in, especially in my nation, Sweden, and to a large extent in Europe as a whole, has grown in the last decades. And I think most of you have seen this uh, chart of world values, right, where all the nations in the world, or almost all the nations in the world have been uh, collected in different clusters and different places in this chart according to how secular the values of the people are and how individualistic the values of the people are. And we who live in Protestant Europe, we find ourselves in the top right hand corner and as you can see, one nation stands out as the, the most individualistic and secular nation on this planet. Uh, so, we who live in Sweden, we, we have a mission to do. And those of you who live in the Catholic nations, you find yourselves in a slightly different value system. And those of you that belong in the Orthodox tradition, you find yourself in even more non-individualistic uh, society and cultures. And we, I think we've discussed these cultures and, and their values in our groups and in our networks during these days. And that's been quite helpful and fruitful to us. So. This movement, the queer movement or the pride movement or whatever we call it, they are unequally strong and unequally have, have unequal power in society in different nations. But the agenda and the philosophy goes in all nations but in different ways. So about this root system then, um, in my own uh, doctoral studies, I study how the autonomy of the individual has been expressed in Sweden during uh, the 20th century and influenced society. And that seems to be a very central part in this ideology uh, and to some extent in secular ideologies in the world uh, as a whole. And in this philosophy, the autonomy of the, individual, in, of the individual is considered to be the highest good. This is the thing that we need to struggle for, uh, which means that we need to battle against certain factors. And these are, and I borrowed this from uh, an American religion professor called Adam Seligman, which I think he, he explains this very well, that if you struggle very strongly for autonomy of the individual, which the pride movement does, you are in constant battle against three factors, namely community. Community is considered to be hindering, capturing. Uh, you need to break free from communities such as family, such as church, such as other kinds of communities that sort of hinder the autonomy of the individual. The other is authority. All kinds of authorities are basically wrong in this ideology. If there is an authority, whatever kind of authority it may be, you need to tear it down. And the final is the sacred, and we would call the sacred God, because God is the highest authority of them all, the one that you can't negotiate with. He, he is God, the, the sacred is the sacred, and uh, he's also the highest form of community. 
And if you struggle for autonomy, you want to get rid of all these. You want to break free from them and you want to rebel against them. And the thing about the LGBTQ or pride movement is that it promotes autonomy in different senses and it also stands in constant opposition to get against the three others. So this is the philosophical background. We may get the impression when we study media, we listen to media voices, that the Pride movement is basically about securing the rights of homosexual individuals. But that is not the case. It's larger than that. It's a philosophy and an ideology, and we need to be able to discuss that and understand that in order to cope with it as well as possible in the public sphere. When we talk about ethics in general, uh, you could say that ethics could be founded on, on three grounds. And I think this is a good way of explaining it. And I can say that boldly because I didn't come up with it myself. I borrowed it from Ravi Zagarias. Uh, and I'm saying it, I'm crediting him now. <laughs> so so we'll, we will hear that. The first one is the autonomous ethics. And what does the word autonomy mean? It means from, the, from Greek, autonomia, which means self-law. I am my own law. You are your own law. They may correspond to each other, but not necessarily. There is a law created only around myself. Another one is the uh, heteronymous moral, created not by myself, but by some kind of higher standard, some kind of higher human standard, not necessarily overhuman or, or supernatural, but some kind of other human commitment or, or, or something that we agree on together. And the third one is obviously that it has a higher ground, a theonomous moral it would have to be then, that it grounded in theos, in God, in a higher ethical standard, independent of, of people. Uh, and we have a situation here, what ethics to follow in a society and how to follow it, because in a secular society, which doesn't count with God at all, uh, they seem to be in some kind of struggle between the autonomous, which is so basic and so central in the ideology, and on the other hand, some kind of heteronomous uh, law. Because if you discuss and if you, if you try to have those discussions, what is morals grounded on, what is right, what is wrong, they may argue autonomously, but on the other hand, they may say that, well, this is absolutely right, and that's not an autonomous culture. So it sort of contradicts each other uh, every now and then. And the challenge for us who belong to church and to be belong to Christianity is to rest on sea. We can also argue uh, our morals from some kind of heteronomous, heteronomous uh, structure or something that we uh, could agree on uh, as humans. But we also need to found it in a higher standard if we are to consider our position Christian. And that's worth remembering, I think. When it comes to sexuality, if we narrow it down then, if we talk something about how people, I'm not going to argue about these different sexual morals, but I'm just going to try to summarize what the four different models of, uh, of sexuality. You could either have a view that says that everything is permitted. And this is the view portrayed by Marquis de Zad, and the reason why the word is sadism is because of him. He says that everything is permitted, no matter what. A slightly narrower one is the one says, that says that everything as, is permitted as long as no one gets hurt. That excludes sadism, right? And uh, we would call that hedonism. Everything that brings pleasure is okay and acceptable as long as nobody gets hurt. Third one is that, well, some things are permitted, some things are forbidden, uh, and those things that are permitted are no, most notably homosexuality. And this, I would say, is the general liberal view in, in the Western society today. And the fourth one is Sex is restricted to lifelong exclusive covenant between one man and one woman, which is the biblical view of sexuality. These are different, and you can argue about them, uh, and you can give 
you can discuss them and say that, okay, this is my position, this is yours, we can discuss together. Uh, I've had, uh, uh, once I, I had a public debate against a Swedish philosopher called Torbjörn Tensjö, <clears throat> who, who is a hedonist, he's a utilitarian, and he, he states that, well, I stand for number two, and I think that's good, but I really don't uh, find it credible to have C, that you say that, well, some things are permitted, did some, some things are forbidden, it doesn't make sense. I accept my own view and, and would argue for it. And I also understand the traditional view, D, but I have trouble arguing with people in C because I find it inconsistent. And I think that's important uh, and, and interesting to hear from him as a atheist philosopher. Now, does anyone follow these uh, views? Yes. The first one is actually followed by the pride movement. And it may sound surprising, but if you study their program, you will find, at least in Sweden, that they accept this view. That few others would accept, obviously, because it's destructive. The second one, well, that is accepted by utilitarians, like Torbjörn Tensch, like Peter Singer, or, or, or other philosophers. The third one is the one that is usually, you know, accepted by secular thought, though it's quite often unreflected. It's quite seldom that they argue why they reject D and why they reject B and stand somewhere in between. And that's interesting because when we have public discussions on this matter, it may be useful to, to bring up that discussion. And D is not only accepted by Christianity, but it is accepted by Christianity in the traditional sense that you know as well as I do that there are Christian denominations who have traveled upwards the scale, uh, but it's also accepted by natural law, it's accepted by most major religions in the world and most traditions. Uh, so, so that's where humanity has traditionally been. We know that sexual interactions appear in other versions and we may condemn them, but the traditions ha have always been that D is what traditional cultures have always st st stood for. Now. How has this view appeared in uh, a social context then, in the public sphere? Uh, the reason why I talk about the example of Sweden and the example of Stockholm actually comes uh, from my wife. She visited, two, two summers ago, she visited Malmö, um, Sweden's third largest city, uh, with, with two of our children on, on a holiday in, in summer, and she came into town not knowing that they just held the, the, the year's Pride Week. So uh, it was kind of a shocking experience to find yourself in a completely different environment than, than you expected. Uh, but one thing she noticed is, was that here are brochures and leaflets from state bureaucracies, state authorities who support this. What is actually the content in it? People very rarely study it. Uh, and neither had she, neither had I. Uh, so she started flicking through uh, the, the, the small leaflet with a program and got astonished, uh, it, not in a positive way. Uh, so when she came home, we discussed that and we, we started figuring maybe we at the Clapham Institute would undertake a study of Sweden's possibly largest lobbying event or, or society influencing event, namely Stockholm Pride, a huge event. And I think. You, you recognize that from a lot of your own capitals, that it's a huge event and everybody is expected to go along in the parade, really not knowing what is the content of it. So uh, we had three authors. My wife, she, she works as a counselor, she was one of them. And we had one psychiatrist and one other uh, psychologist or, or counselor uh, who wrote about uh, what uh, are the implications for public health if we study the program of Stockholm Pride. Uh, so we didn't do any, any discussion on sexual ethics at all. We just studied what is the content of the program. And you can do that quite easily because they have a search function on their, their website. You can't control it now because they've taken down last year's program. Uh, so I, I understood that we have to do this now in the autumn, one and a half years ago. Uh, so, so I did the job of doing the research, and that was tough. Uh, you, ha, have you done such a study going into the program of yours? No, you rarely do, and very, very few people do. And 
what I did, what I found when I did it, and then, then the authors went forward and, and sort of structured it, and they wrote about the implications for public health and so on. We have a, not a positive uh, public health situation in Sweden, and I guess that, that goes for several countries when it comes to suicide, suicide attempts, mental health, loneliness, etc., etc., self-harm, and so on. Um, what we found, we... we uh, investigated this under a few different headlines. What was most dominating and most surprising, I was expecting to have sort of a vari variety of rainbows and colors and light and party and, and some provocative elements that I would question. But the thing is that the popular picture of the Pride Festival is that it's about human dignity, as it's called in Sweden, the equal value for all people. That is sort of the Swedish slogan. And when I did a search, and that's why we, we, did, we did this uh, cover of it, of it, both we called it The Colourful Darkness, that is the title of it, and then we put the picture of, of the search engine where I searched for human dignity or equal value for all people, and I got zero, zero hits. No program point, and they, they have hundreds. Deal with this. Neither the parade itself, n nor any of the program points, nor, no seminar, n nothing whatsoever. But what, what was the actual intent was a very dark world and very troubling to, to look into. And I, I feel sort of the goosebumps coming on, uh, on me while I, while I speak about it, because it's, it's not a fun reading, not for anyone. Uh, what we found that it's, it, yes, some arrangements are about love, not mainly by the arrangers themselves, but by outside sponsors. They want to be there because it's a, a popular place to be and you get good credit in society if you are, are in, in pride surroundings. And some of them were about love. Though, when it is about love in this context, it's always in the autonomous version. That is, you don't have the agape, you know, dimension of love. It's only focused on yourself and what you feel and what you want. It is, however, to a large extent about sex. And uh, I have no problem about having public events or, or seminars about sex. Uh, the, the problem with this is that, that it was always in under this queer umbrella. So homosexuality is actually quite a small portion of the Pride Festival, at least in Stockholm. You may... You may uh, investigate what it is in your other nations, but homosexuality is actually quite a small part of it. But the queer bit, that is, you know, the trans bit, the uh, questioning of every foundation, every kind of foundation, when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to gender, and so on and so forth. Um, it is not about this popular and joyous picture than you see when you study and search in the program. Uh, it's not about joy and light, though there are some hits when it comes to darkness, which is interesting and perhaps telling. Um, I search for what views, how do they present things that are usually considered positive in society, like relations, like commitment, norms and responsibility. I guess that most people would agree that th these are positive things in, in a society. The thing is that they're almost always portrayed in a negative light. Because norms, they capture people, right? They're some kind of authority, and we don't like authorities. And responsibility, etc., etc., and commitment, obviously, because that means you commit yourself to another one, and that's not the point in the autonomous agenda. That is that you withdraw from commitment and think about yourself. Uh, it does however, present positive things on a few things when it comes to relations between people, and that is anarchy. And it sounds so strange, but it is portrayed positively. They, they, they have several arrangements under the, uh, under the title Relationship Anarchy, and that is something good, because you do whatever you like with whomever you like and have what, whatever kind of relationship to anyone, because you're the king. It's all about you. Even egoism is presented in a positive way. How do we develop egoism or egotism? It's a very different world than we're used to studying or, or being. And 
The thing that was worst uh, and most troublesome to, to uh, watch and study, uh, and that made that I sort of had to, well, just shut down and go outside and breathe and, 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 and cry for a while. Because it was so dark when it came to, uh, when it ca uh, came to things that we usually consider negative in society, like pornography. Pornography is illegal in Sweden. It's not illegal in all your nations, but it is in Sweden. And um, They don't use the word pornography. You get zero hits on pornography. But when you search for sex work, you get several seminars and arrangements describing how do we make it better. Not, not that they think it's a negative thing, but how do we help the sex workers do their thing? Because that is what they do, and sex work is part, part of what we do. Um, drugs. There is a trend in, in these circles where men meet men and have sexual experience and, and, and enhance it with, with the help of drugs. They call it chemsex. And when you study the, the surroundings in, in these milieus, uh, in Britain and in, in other nations, it's so terrible, it's so devastating, it's so anti-human to anyone. And there are a lot of young men who get trapped in this and caught in this and they get absolutely no help in the Pride movement. They discuss, well, we have drugs and we use drugs and how do we, do we use them in, in, in these situations? It was so tragic to read. Same thing goes with what falls under the, the title BDSM and it's very strange. I sort of use that acronym like any other acronym now. It stands for, what is it? bondage, dominance, sadism, and masochism. And there are several arrangements dealing with that theoretically and practically. And we, otherwise in society, we say that one part dominating another one, that's a bad thing. But in this context, it's a good thing because you're free to experiment with whichever you like. Self-harm, causing pain to the own body, making it bleed. That, that's terrible society. We, we, do we try to avoid it as much as we can when it comes to young girls and others. But in this context, it's considered that's something we do. How can we get an extra kick out of this? So a lot of people get trapped in this and they don't get help. So it's a very dark world and it's not hidden. Everything here can be find, found in the official program. The thing is that nobody has bothered to study it. So what we did with this then <clears throat> was to lift this up and present this uh, at a public seminar and present it to the press and invite the arrangers, invite the sponsors, both uh, the private and the state uh, bureaucracies who, who give a lot of money to this. And under the question, which is this, what responsible politician or social worker would affirm this? No one would affirm this or even accept it in any other part of society. But as long as it's hidden under the rainbow flag, everything is permitted. And it's very sad because it hurts people. So that's why we, why we felt we, we need to lift this up, even though it's difficult. And even though we know we will probably get attacked for this. The, the, the most usual uh, way to, to, to meet this and to, to take part in the discussion was not to do it at all, to try to silence it down, because it's difficult. If you have you know, a paradigm in general, you don't want to have your paradigm cha uh, cha challenged. Um, you want to keep your picture that the rainbow flag only stands for tolerance and good things, but it doesn't. So what we did, we, we presented this and uh, it became difficult in some ways. It did, but it, it was also necessary. And now I want to move over to, to a few uh, pieces of advice that I would like to, to give to, to myself and to the rest of you, how we deal with these questions when we, for instance, feel or fear that somebody will attack us which is most probable that they will if we lift these issues, especially in, in nations where the personal autonomy has gone so far as in Sweden. Uh, you, don't you don't attack a basic creed in a culture without the risk of being attacked. Uh, so you may feel like you are the little David and you meet the huge Goliath. And maybe the case was that the homosexual group felt that they were the Davids in the 1960s, 70s, and they felt that they need a position in society, need to be seen as persons, yeah? Uh, but it's quite a different 
situation now. Uh, the, the organizations who deal with these issues, they are the Goliaths, they control society and they control the politicians. Uh, so you may feel like it, David, and, and we did as well. And wh one thing that I uh, try to remind myself of is we hear labels, labels put on it, us, and I don't even want to, to repeat them because I don't think they are valid and, and they're sound. But we often get to hear that we have some kind of phobia when we criticize not people, but when we criticize philosophies like this one. Uh, uh, and the, the thing I, I try to do, if possible, is to ignore it. Uh, altogether. Uh, I wouldn't say that I have a phobia, I wouldn't say that I have a psychi psychiatric disorder. I like to raise an issue that I find highly problematic for people and a philosophy that I disagree with. Uh, so the first thing is to try to ignore it and the other is to reveal them, expose them and hopefully defeat them in an open discussion and, and say what is this actually about and <clears throat> I guess you've done what we did in, in our network discuss how Jesus meets different questions that are actually formed as traps <clears throat> and one other thing is that yes you may get attacked you may get attacked by people who hate you or what you stand for uh, they may be anti-Christian, but they may also be Christians, and that's perhaps worse than others. If they question your motives or, or question other things from inside Christianity, where we should be on the same page. And I have been attacked myself as well. Uh, and sometimes it can be painful, but, but I stand here, I have survived, and you will survive too. Uh, it's very rare that we will pay with our lives for our faith or for, for our political or ideological or philosophical convictions. <clears throat> Very often we survive. And uh, here I have a, a, a suggestion to myself and to you that we always keep close to the Lord's heart. That will help us to do what, say what we need to say and say it in a way that is fruitful. And I think about the, the day when this happened, we sent out information to all Swedish media. Uh, only the Christian newspapers came to the seminar, but uh, Swedish National Radio uh, tried to, to invite uh, us and uh, the organization, uh, Pride organization, to a debate on, on National Radio. And to my big surprise, they said yes. And uh, the three authors felt that, well, I'm not really a debate kind of person, so I don't want to be in de a debate. And that's okay. So uh, I, I'm more familiar with that uh, way of, of, of discussing. So I took uh, the debate on, on radio. So I went to the, the, the radio house there. Uh, and when I came to the guard, the chairman, the female chairman of, of Pride Stockholm came at the same time and I didn't know it was her because I didn't recognize her, I'd not seen her before. So he came in and, and uh, found that we were going to the same debate, obviously, uh, and then we were a bit early. So we got 20 minutes sitting together outside the radio studio and that could have feel, felt very awkward, right? Uh, that I meet Goliath and how do I deal with this, what do we do together? Uh, but the thing was, and, and I'm being personal now, uh, was that I, I saw how small she, she, she looked. Uh, not perhaps on the outside just, but, but on the inside. She was used to always being, uh, uh, holding the agenda, saying this is the message I want to, to preach and everybody will listen to it and everybody will follow it. For the first time, she was the one being scrutinized and she was the one being criticized. And I saw she, she felt a bit nervous about it. And somehow, I felt the, the love of the Lord came over me, for her as a person. Because every person is a person, and loved by God. So, I, I took the moment there to share the vision and the background of our institute, the Clapham Institute, and our vision to, to free the enslaved, uh, and the background about that. I also saw that she had a necklace with a Star of David around her neck. So I could talk about how I appreciate the Jewish people and so on. So we had a really good conversation, like two ordinary people outside there. And then we came into the radio studio and, and, and had the debate. And I haven't listened to it afterwards, actually, but I, I got a very good feeling to it, and other people who have listened to it told me that afterwards, too. It had a much, much softer tone, and, and it had 
well, she did get critical questions, which has more or less never happened before. Uh, and we had a very good discussion. And I didn't get the regular attacks that we are, we are accustomed to do. Uh, so it, it became a very good debate. So we, we went outside and we, I said that I could actually come to the, or anyone from us could come to the Pride uh, Festival in the summer if you want an open discussion, but they never returned that invitation. And the, the day after that, uh, they phoned the, the national TV and cancelled the debate that was supposed to be there. They, somehow, they felt that we have nothing to gain on this debate. But I find it very, very important to lift things up. And that's why I use the, 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 the phrase uncovering. Um, you, you see what's on the cover of, of the rainbow flag and, and, and the Pride uh, Festival and movement. And it all sounds so positive. But just underneath the cover, there is this dark content that is dark and harmful to, to everyone, to every group. So uh, I'd like to say a few things about, about a foundation, what foundation we build on when we communicate our philosophy, our view of morals, um, and the other side as well. Our foundation should be, and goal as, as well, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so help us God, because we cannot do that all by ourselves. But we try to, to focus on that, what is, what is actually true. And the opposite side, the autonomous culture, they are, as we said, they are in some kind of constant rebellion against norms, against authority. And if you think of it, all kinds of sins uh, are a consequence of this. No matter if it's heterosexual sin, if it's homosexual sin, or any kind of sin. That's where, when we put ourselves as the center and not what is right, what is true. And if we believe in God, like we do in this room, we, what is pleasing to God. And uh, I'm only going to, to quote one Bible verse, and it has nothing to do with sexual ethics, but it has to do about when arrogant obstacles are raised. You remember what Paul uh, mentions this? Uh, we, we are reading 2 Corinthians right here at this conference. He says that there, there are cases when arrogant obstacles are raised up. But remember that when they do, and you might feel frightened and threatened, they always race up. Have you thought about that? They race up towards or against the knowledge of God. And if we stand on a biblical position, which I think is sound and valid, we stand on a more solid ground. And I'd like to show you two pictures to, to illustrate this. Uh, I think uh, Ray may, may recognize this as you're Swedish. Uh, anyone else recognize uh, what, what this is? Bibles. Yeah, this is a piece of art uh, uh, by uh, artist Lars Wilks, who is more of a provocateur, uh, provoking anyone for anything. Uh, I wouldn't agree with very, very much he says, but he's, uh, well, he's a critical person, that, that is the case. And he's created this, an art work, where he's collected uh, pieces of uh, uh, wood that he's found, and he nailed them together. It doesn't matter what they, what they look like or how they sit, because life has no meaning, because he doesn't believe in God. So he's, he's consistent in his views, and this is not a beautiful piece of art, and it will not stand in a thousand years. And if we compare this, sort of raising up and being very angry, if we compare another kind of, of building, and they're actually building and repairing it here, this stands on a solid ground, as it's based on truth and on love. And if we stand on the same ground, we stand on a ground that, that will hold together. And we say, uh, the other one, they, they may shout and they may be very angry and throw labels at you. But it, if it doesn't stand on the truth, it, it will fall down. So that will give us confidence and perhaps inspiration when we feel that we're threatened. Okay, some, some pieces of advice then on how to battle an autonomous ideology, which is the root behind the Pride movement. Um, I'm going to give you a picture here. I actually look for, for one outside, and we have actually got one in here too, but this one. Uh, you may feel that you face a fire, and the fire looks dangerous and hot and, and terrible, and you need to battle it. How do you do it? Have you read on the signs on the fire extinguishers? You aim at the base of the fire. 
Because the flames are not the dangerous thing. You may burn yourself and so on, but the real source of the fire is, is not the flames. It's the fire down there, the base of the fire. So, so my point here is that you may run a risk of focusing all, on all the things that you see and you find them, oh, it's terrible, it looks disgusting, I don't want anything to do with it. Uh, so I attack and I criticize that, and you could do that. But more important is to criticize the base, the philosophical base or the moral base or whatever is the center of, of the whole thing. And that's what we tried to do with this report, explaining, well, also the flames and the fruits of it stating how dangerous this is for individuals and for a society. But don't concentrate just on the flames, but focus on the base. That's what you do when you extinguish a fire. Uh, the second one, I, I like to think about what, what tunes are sung in society, so to speak. There are tunes that we might find that they have a wrong tone. They're wrong. Uh, we should expose them, but we should also make sure to keep up singing the right ones, like William Booth said, you know, he said, why should the devil have all the good melodies? But there are better melodies that we can sing. And I, I borrowed, actually, uh, a part from a song by, by uh, a group that I, I fancied. Let's see if you can uh, see who they are, because they describe a situation in a society that is not as good as it should be. I took the wrong road that led to the wrong tendencies. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time for the wrong reason and the wrong rhyme. Who are the artists? Depeche Mode. <laughs> and the song is obviously titled Wrong. They sing about everything that has gone wrong and it could be so for individuals and it can also be so for a society where I was on the wrong page of the wrong book with the wrong rendition of the wrong hook, made the wrong move every wrong night. And now I, I'm going to give you the, the line that I think is so central here to understand. With the wrong tune played till it sounded right. Mm -hmm. And that sort of summarizes the society and the culture that we live in, doesn't it? That if you sing the wrong tune, as many times as possible, people start figuring that this is probably right. Things that were considered evidently wrong some decades ago in all societies are now considered to be, well, this should be very right, even though people in their heart understand that, well, I feel a bit uncomfortable and I don't really know why, but they've been singing it for so long that I now think it's right. And that's very important to remember, I think. So. Therefore, I would say that we should live and we should communicate good examples of relations when it comes to commitment. Commitment is something good. It's not something bad. Everyone knows that for, for children and for spouses and for people, it's good that we can trust each other, rely on each other. Commitment is something good. Marriage is something good, not something to be split and destroyed. So therefore, we should know, show each other, our churches, our society, and our children, obviously, good examples. And also doing our best to show God's form of love, which is the agape, which is not about me. It's about my wife, it's about my children, it's about other persons, with not myself as a center. You could focus on the bad example, yes, and you should expose them, but don't keep all the focus on that, but show the good example, sing the right tune, so people see that there is actually tone that is sound and that is good and healing for people. So finally, some, some pieces of advice then. There is experience. Experience has always been important in, in all human cultures. What does father say? What did grandfather say? What have we taught? What have we learned from them? That is important because they have lived longer than we have and they've made mistakes and they can tell us. And we who are older than young people, we can tell the young ones our experiences, both our positive and our negative ones, to teach them. In the autonomous culture, you always throw that overboard and say that experience is bad. You, you find your own identity because there is no identity. But previous experience and research, there is research on the LGBTQ movement and all the things concerning them, and we should use them because they're important. 
And secondly, what, what we did and what I would strongly advise you to do is that I guess you have pride festivals in all your nations and your capitals or, or whichever city it may be. Look into the program. It may be dark. You may, you may feel terrible inside because it's, it's, it's not nice. Not because you have a particular view on sexuality, but, but because you're a sane person who find that prostitution is destructive, that, that drugs are destructive and so on. But I would advise you to do that. And then you can present that to, to your politicians, to other people, and showing them, do you think this is good? This is the actual content. And we've been able to do that in Sweden, and we've been able to send that to politicians and policymakers in different towns. Uh, so that's been very useful in order to put the light on what is it actually about. Now, in the Pride pro program and in the queer business in general, the children are very rarely in the center. But we need to have the children in the center and defend the children and preserve the children and, and guard them from things that are very destructive to them. And we've been discussing them in, a, in, in my network today uh, about legislation in Britain, for instance. How do we put a stop for, for pornography, for, for instance, for children? Uh, because we know that there, there are wolves out there and we need to guard the children from the wolves. So defend the, the children's right to be children and not to be influenced by an agenda that threatens them in, like, for instance, the trans community have drawn down strongly during the last 10 years and made the, the curves go very fast upwards on the number of children and young people who want to change their biological sex. And I'll come back to that. But we all have a moral intuition. All people have that. No matter if, if we're Christians or, or if we're atheists, we all have some kind of moral intuition. That's how court treat us. Uh, you, you treat, they treat us that we ought to know the whole law. Otherwise, they condemn us and judge us. Uh, and we also should connect to people's conscience. People's conscience are a friend. It's not an enemy. And that's important to remember as well. Because people feel that there is something wrong and something not good about this content of self-harm and, and all these terrible things that take place under the rainbow cover. And I would like to connect to a TV program that was uh, sent on Swedish television just a couple of weeks ago that really connected to people's conscience, finally. And it was fantastic to see. No Christian organization could have made a TV program as good as this, uh, I, I can assure you. Uh, it was called the trans train and they actually interviewed two especially uh, portraits of two young women who were had a difficult period in their teenage years and found out that perhaps i'm not uh, a girl perhaps i'm not a woman perhaps i need to change sex for instance this this uh, young woman uh, she comes from finland the other young woman came from sweden and she looked like that on the right hand side of the picture she felt i'm ugly nobody likes me there's something wrong with me what can i do to get accepted perhaps and then she heard the stories that pour through media if you change your sex, you will be free. And she lived like that for a while, and she felt worse and worse. And now she was interviewed, and another young woman as well, who wanted to detransition, transition back to her biological sex. And, and she did whatever she could to do that, but also she said, I'll, I'll never get my breasts back, I, and I will always have this dark voice, and I will never get this back, she said. And, and it's a tragedy. And it's a tragedy, a human tragedy. And there are several of them. And people's conscience should obviously say, if you want to do such an enormous change in your body, you need to a bit, be a little bit more cautious. That's the, the least thing we could say. And if you look, and that's quite fascinating, she didn't say anything about it on, uh, during the program, but if you see what's around her neck, that's a cross. And I don't know why. I don't know what, what, what she wants to single with it, but perhaps it's some kind of longing. Maybe there is someone that is pure. Maybe there is someone who, who would love me for who I am, no matter what. And the cross sort of 
has become a symbol for that for, for many people in many times, in many cultures. So that was fantastic to see in this program. They also interviewed people in Britain who have jumped off the, the bandwagon, so to speak, jumped off the, the trans train and left it because they said that I, I can no longer stand for this. So the conscience of people is our friend. We need to connect to it. And considering this, considering people's gender and sex, we should trust a biblical anthro anthropology and an established Christian view on relations because it has been developing during 2000 years and I think it's sound. I think it's good for people that there is a God who has created us and loves us and wants us to live together in love and he has a model for it. And I think that's valid for any society no matter how big Christianity is in that society. One more thing is that we live in a town where actually we can see the stones starting to cry out. This program is absolutely such a, a thing. As far as I know, none of the uh, uh, people behind the program were Christians. But they are stones that find that this is terrible. This is hurting several people. We need to do something. We need to lift up the truth. And what we ought to do then is that we should definitely follow in follow along with the stones when they cry out. And if we think of a culture like a pendulum, you see, it has, it's moved very, very far away from its natural state. And after a while, gravity seems to pull it back again. And we seem to be in that position. Sometimes we see that the, 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 the pendulum is starting to, to fall back again. And what we need to do, at least as Christians, is to follow it along and help it back to its natural state. Some Christians, they have a tendency to think that, well, we, we live in this autonomous, individualistic, non-Christian culture. We need to just follow that. But we shouldn't, because it's not true and because it's not good for people. And finally then, our motive and our method should always be love. We love individuals no matter their sexuality, no matter their gender, possible problems, no matter what. Jesus loved everyone, Jesus came to everyone to meet every person, to transform every person, because we all need transformation. Some people need more transformation, some need less. But we should always love every individual, not every ideology. This is a false and dangerous ideology that I think we should battle. And when we do so, we can do what Psalm 45 says. That's another, that's another Bible verse. Psalm 44, 45 says that, defend truth, humility, and justice. This may not seem to go together in our culture. Either you talk about truth and you're very persistent, or you're very humble and you don't think anything about anything. But do like Jesus. He could combine these. Be very truthful, very sharp to those who needed it, and also be humble be loving, and work for justice, and all that lies behind it. Jesus did this, we could do that to some extent, and with the Lord's help, we could do something and influence our society in a positive way.